So, points of inflection, concavity, we should think second derivative. So, we need the first derivative before we can get to the second derivative. Um, low d high minus high d low. So, we get 0 minus 6 times 2x all over low squared. Now, we definitely want to simplify that before we take the derivative again. So, numerator is just negative 12x. We're still left with x squared plus 3 squared on the bottom. I'm not going to multiply that out. Leave it in factored form. Okay, second derivative, same process. Low d high, this time the top does have a derivative, minus high d low. We've got to use the chain rule. Bring down the exponent, keep the inside the same, subtract 1 from the exponent, multiply by the derivative of the inside. All over the bottom squared. So squaring something that's already squared makes it to the fourth power. I'm going to give you a second to write all that down, and then we'll keep going. Okay, let's clean that stuff up on the top, because that numerator just looks like a mess right now. So I'm going to put that negative 12 in front of the x squared plus 3 squared, because that's where coefficients always go. A negative minus, minus a negative is the same as adding a positive. We've got 12 times 2 times 2, so that's 12 times 4, that's 48. And x times x is x squared. Now that made it look a lot nicer. But there's still actually a little bit that we can do. And we're going to need to do it um, to help us when we're getting ready to set this equal to zero. We can factor out a UCF. We've got negative 12 and 48. Well, they have 12 in common. It's kind of up to you whether you want to factor out a negative. I would. Um, I'd go ahead and take out the negative 12. And then they also both have x squared plus 3. One of them squared, one of them's not, so we can take out one of them. And since I just factored out a set of parentheses, that's when I like to throw in a bracket just so things are clear to me. I took out the negative 12. I took out one of the x squared plus 3s, so I've got x squared plus 3. I'm going to go ahead and drop the parentheses because I know I'm going to end up combining it with something else later. So I'm just going to drop my parentheses. 48 taking out a negative 12 leaves me with a negative 4. I didn't do anything with that x squared, and I took out that x squared uh, plus 3. Now, there is one more thing that we can simplify, but for the sake of space and time, I'm just going to do it when I set it equal to 0. Okay, so we need to set the second derivative equal to zero. We have a denominator, so we also have to consider where the denominator is equal to zero. So we've got negative 12 is equal to zero. X squared plus 3 is equal to zero. X squared minus 4 squared is a minus 3. X squared plus 3 is equal to zero. And then we also have to consider the denominator equal to zero. And technically I could have factored out the, or I could have canceled the X squared plus 3 kind of overlooked that, but it's okay. Alright, so negative 12 over equals 0. So x squared plus 3 over equals 0. No, we're squaring a number and we're adding 3 to it. That's always going to be positive. Okay, so we don't have anything out of that. That means I don't have anything out of the last one either. Uh, let's check this other one. I'm going to add the 3x squared. Divide by 3. So I've got 1 is equal to x squared. Take the square root. Don't forget the positive and the negative. So those are our possible points of inflection. Negative 1, positive 1. 
I'm sorry. Uh, because they can never equal zero. Negative 12, that makes equal zero. X squared plus three. You're squaring a number, which is going to be positive, and you're adding three to it, so that's never going to equal zero. And then if you raise that to the fourth, it's still not going to equal zero. So. I added it to the other side. Oh, where did it come from? Oh, it came from this right here. X squared minus 4x squared. I can buy my real life terms. Okay, um, let's test 0, which is okay because that doesn't cause it to be undefined. Negative 2 and positive 2, remember we're plugging these into the second derivative. We're checking the signs of the second derivative. So, for the second derivative, we've got negative 12 times, when we square negative 2, we're going to get a positive. We add 3 to it, we're still going to get a positive. And let's see here. We square negative 2, we get 4. Multiply by negative 3, we get negative 12. Plus 3, it's still a negative. And the bottom's always going to be positive. So we've got a two negatives and two positives, so that result's always going to be positive. Negative times negative, positive, the rest of it's positive. Zero. Plug in zero. Negative 12 is always negative. Zero squared plus three is positive. Uh, negative three times zero squared is zero plus three is positive. And the bottom is always going to be positive, so one negative makes that whole thing negative. Positive two, negative 12 is still negative. Positive two squared plus three is positive. Bless you, bless you. Uh, negative 3 times 4, same result with that, so that's going to be a negative, positive, so that is positive. So we are concave up from negative infinity to negative 1, and from 1 to infinity, and we are concave down between negative 1 and 1. And I'd really like to know what this function looks like. 6 over x squared plus 3. I'm going to graph it just so that we get a visual. 6 over x squared plus 3. And go back to my standard window. There we go. Okay, so here you can see this is not our typical rational function. We're used to rational functions having asymptotes, but if you think about the original, um, we have asymptotes where the original, where the denominator is zero, and squared plus three is never going to equal zero. Um, we don't have any holes either because we can't factor anything out. So um, let me make my y values a little bit smaller so we can see a little bit better. Um, yeah. So you can see, hopefully you can see the chain of time value. It's concave up right here, okay? And then about right here, you can see that it changes. It's concave down there at the top, and then it's concave up again. This kind of sort of looks like a normal curve a little bit, if you remember any of that statistics stuff. Um, just kind of a side note there. Okay, uh, let's look at one more. Oops. So good. Oh, look at another polynomial. This time we're going to use the second derivative test to find our relative extrema. Okay, we're going to find our relative extrema for a polynomial. Okay, notice it's not asking about concavity or points of inflection, but if we're concave up at a critical point, then it's going to be a minimum. If we're concrete down at a critical point, it's going to be a maximum. So we're going to use both the first derivative and the second derivative 
of this function. So first derivative is negative 15x to the fourth plus 15x squared. And I'm going to go ahead and take my second derivative while I'm at it. 15 times 4 is 60. 15 times 2 is 30. Okay, so relative extrema, those are critical points. Or critical numbers, that's the derivative is equal to 0. So when we set our derivative equal to 0, we need to factor out a negative 15x squared. We get a positive x squared minus 1. So when we set both of those equal to 0, we get x is 0, and we get x squared is equal to 1. So x is equal to positive and negative 1. Now, at this point, we could set up our number line and plug values into the derivative and see where it changes from negative to positive and positive to negative to identify whether negative 1, 0, and positive 1 are maxes or mins. But now that we know the second derivative test, that means that we can plug our critical points into the second derivative and we can just check their sign. So I am going to go ahead and factor it for the sake of making plugging in easier. I'm going to take out a negative 30x, so that leaves me with a positive 2x squared minus 1. Correct? Negative 30 times 2 is going to be 60. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to plug negative 1, 0, and 1 into my second derivative. I'm going to plug my critical points into my second derivative. I'm going to test their signs. If we're concave up at that point, then it's a minimum. If we're concave down at that point, then it's a maximum. So when we plug in negative 1, I really don't care what the value is. I just care about whether it's positive or negative. So negative 30 times negative 1 is a positive. When I plug negative 1 into 2x squared minus 1, that's going to give me 2 minus 1, which is positive. So that means f prime of one, or f double prime of negative one is positive. So that means at negative one we are concave up. So that is a minimum at negative one. When we plug in zero, we get zero times a negative, which is zero. There was a note at the bottom of your second derivative test. If your second derivative also equals zero, then your second derivative test fails. You'll have to use the first derivative to determine whether zero is a maximum or a minimum. So we can't, about, uh, we can't do that one yet. Let's plug in one. We get a negative times a positive, so that is negative. So that means it's concave down, which is a maximum. So the only point that we need to test for the first derivative is 0. Now we can't use negative 1 and positive 1 because those were also critical numbers. So we've got to use negative 0.5 and positive 0.5. So, hmm? Negative 1 Yes, it does. Because if you, put, if you put something less than negative 1, then you're testing a value to the left of that critical number. Okay, so negative 0.5, uh, when you square it, it's positive, so negative 15 is a negative, and negative 0.5 squared is positive 1 fourth minus 1, that's a negative, so it's positive. When we plug in 0.5, still going to get a negative for the first part and a negative for the second part, so it's still positive, so there's no change at zero. Zero is neither a maximum nor a minimum. Um, our relative extrema occur at, let's find f of negative 1. So negative 3 times negative 1 plus 5 times negative 1, because when you raise negative 1,